Well, good evening, everybody. Um, thank you very much for inviting me to come and talk about the history of caffins. There are a number of f family firms which started in Eastbourne. Um, you probably know um, Brewers, the decorators, and Llewellyn's, the builders, and Luigi Ford's, the hardware company. But tonight I'm, I'm going to talk about caffins. And I should say that I've used a booklet called The Story of Caffins from 1865, which was researched and compiled by Linda Gowans, one of our staff. And the PowerPoint which I'm using was prepared by David Stone Lee, one of our regional directors. Well, the name Caffin first appeared in Sussex back in 1327 when a Richard Caffin lived in a village called Chitkum near Breed. And then another Richard Caffin was vicar of Horsham. And then an Edward Caffin, well, he was locked up in the Tower of London um, and he scratched his name on the wall, I gather. But in, in the 17th century, there was a famous Matthew Caffin, who was a Baptist preacher, and he stuck to his beliefs, unlike the Vicar of Bray, and therefore at one time was imprisoned in Newgate Prison, Maidstone Prison, and Horsham Prison, and he was called the Battle Axe of Sussex. More recently, um, in 1861, a William Caffin was the Surrey cricketer who went out with the first team to Australia. Well, he stayed on and he coached the Australians and did rather too good a job. <laughs> but the firm of Caffins was founded by William Morris Caffin in 1865, and he was born in 1842. Now, you can see um, William in the middle, and then later you'll hear about Harry, who's at the top left, and Percy, or P.T., on the top right. So that was his family. Excuse me, can you stand a bit? Well, a bit more, oops, so sorry. Um, is that any better? Thank you. Oh, no, dear, oh, dear, oh, dear. Well, I'll go back a bit. How about that? <laughs> right. So, um, now, W.M., or William Morris, was born in 1842, and when he was 14, he was apprenticed to his uncle, Ebenezer Morris, to learn the trade of ironmonger, tin man, and brazier. And he earned two shillings a week, rising to ten shillings in the fifth year. So that was 10p a week and 50p after f in the fifth year. Well, he was required to observe the strict provisions of his apprenticeship. Oh, sorry, I'm, I'll get used to this in a minute. There we go. And the apprenticeship said, he shall not waste the goods of his said master nor lend them unlawfully to any, he shall not commit fornication, nor contract matrimony within the said term, he shall not play at cards or dice tables, or any other unlawful games whereby his said master may have any loss with his own goods, he shall not haunt taverns or playhouses, nor absent himself from his said master's service day or night unlawfully. Well, he, he managed to um, abide by that for five years, 
And after he'd completed his apprenticeship, he opened his own shop, and on the 19th of May, 1865, he opened the shop in that ivy-covered covered house, and that was in Meads Road, um, quite close to where our present head office is, near the town hall, and behind the, the house, of course, is the Saffrons. Well, he advertised himself as a gas and hot water fitter, bell hanger, brass finisher, tinman, and brazier. And he seemed to prosper, and um, he opened another shop in Seaside Road next to the site where the Hippodrome was built. You'll appreciate that in, in 1870 there weren't any cars. Um, in fact, um, the railway arrived in Eastbourne, as you local historians will know, in 1849, but otherwise the form of uh, transport was riding a horse or having a horse carriage, riding in a carriage or, or horse-drawn vehicle. Well, in 1871, he obtained a license to store petrol and added lamp and oil merchant to the services he could offer. And then in 1892, Percy and Harry joined him. Those were the two um, young, young, uh, his younger sons. And they expanded into electrical domestic appliances. And so that was their letter heading in 1904. But in 1901, they installed the electric lighting in the pier. Well, those of you who, who've lived in Eastbourne know that in 2014, the pier caught fire, and some people said it was an electrical fault. Um, we just hope there was some rewiring between the time that um, <laughs> he, he did it and the fire. Now, um, he was also advertising that they, they did bell boards, and this is supplied by W.M. Caffin. And then, in 1902, was the first involvement with a car. And this is um, Harry's words. One day, a young fellow who was staying at Marine Parade came along with a four-cylinder Renault car, the first live axle car we'd seen, and said, could, could he stand it on the veranda outside or he'd pay for accommodation? Well, the shop had been a butcher's and was fitted with wide sashes um, and to draw up, and when pushed up, there was plenty of headroom for a car to get under, but there was the bottom sill. And then this is Harry cut away after dark without asking the landlord's permission and boarded over the gap and in went the first car. And then soon after that, the Queen's Hotel asked if two cars could be stored and polished. And Harry and Percy decided that the car had a future. So they converted the butcher's shop to hold four cars. And you can see the sort of cars. <coughs> this was um, in 1904. And um, 
you'll see there's no protection from the weather and um, there's no indicators. If you were going to turn left, you had to sort of wave your arm oh, this way around, I think, yes. And, um, but that, that was the sort of car which they had in their first garage. And then in 1904, it was expanded to hold 16 cars. And the staff increased to 48. And then the brothers acquired a site on the corner of Marine Parade, Marine Parade and Seaside Road. And this was opened in 1906. And they built this garage to provide sales, service, coach building facilities, and had room for a hundred cars. Now, many people in Eastbourne at that time thought it was a bit ridiculous. Eastbourne wouldn't ever have a hundred cars. But um, to be fair, that the, the brothers were proved right. And this um, Marine Parade had an electric car lift, and that was one of the first um, car lifts in, in England, I think. So it <coughs> took them up to the first floor for storage and then up to the second floor where there was the repair department. And this was the sort of catalogue they had. Caffin's brothers have pleasure in presenting to the nobility and gentry and all interested in motoring a brief account of the splendid facilities they now possess. So that was in 1906. Well then in 1908 the colonnade garage was closed and they opened lockups in Grange Road. Um, I don't know it, those of you who know Bibendum on the corner, it's just along the road from Bibendum on the left. I think they'd originally been stables. And then in 1911, that's the Meads Road offices, and which is still there now. And on the first floor, there were, it was called Saffron's Rooms, and it was um, let out for receptions, amateur theatricals, lectures, private dances and concerts. And it has a sprung floor, and it's one of the few head offices which um, have... Uh, typists on a sprung floor. And this was the showroom down below, and those were the sort of cars in 1912. And this was the first page of a Coachworks catalogue published in 1912. And in those days, it, coach works or body works was very important. <coughs> These were the sort of vehicles which they made. What happened, um, I'll, I'll come back to, the, these are the sort of vehicles in the body work catalogue. Um, In Marine Parade, they had coach building and engineer shops, and they built on chassis which the manufacturers had made. And then the um, 
the coach building was an important part of the work. Many vehicle manufacturers, especially in the luxury and commercial sectors of the market, supplied only the vehicle rolling chassis, which would have included all the mechanical components, leaving the choice and style of body to the customer, who would then choose a coach builder to design a body to their own personal requirements. And if we just go back a moment, you, you can see the. Um, oh dear, um, you can see some of the vehicles of the coachwork which they carried out. Some of you will have known about Hermitage, who who were a piano firm. But those were the sort of vehicles which were manufactured and sold. Then new showrooms were built um, in 56 Terminus Road and that's the building you probably all know WH Smith's in Terminus Road. Well at one time that was the company head office. And um, this was the letter heading. You can see this is Marine Parade, and that's the Meads Road. Well, in 1914, of course, the war came, and nearly all the staff volunteered. A lot of them had been in the TA, and they volunteered for military service. And during the war, um, sort of half of the engineers um, were called up, but the staff actually increased to about 450, a lot of them women, in order to manufacture aircraft parts and um, about 75 Sopwith Experimental 5A scout planes were made at Marine Parade. And this is a bit of the fabric of one of those planes which was shot down at Ypres in Polygon Wood in 1918. After, after the war, the, um, they acquired this Ford servicing depot, which is or was next to the GPO uh, near the station. It's now, I think, a dentist surgery. Well. As we mentioned, Coachworks was important, and this is the display at the Olympia Motor Show. And this is another vehicle which, um, it's a private ambulance. And then they also made these um, railway, miniature railway carriages, which used to be on the crumbles where the, um, we've now got or, or the um, marina, and wh when they stopped using it in Eastbourne, I think it was sent to um, Dorset, and you can still travel on one of, the, one of these carriages. There we are again. Well, the, manu the various manufacturers made the bodies, and particularly Rolls-Royce, um, and then 
we would do the coach works uh, for, for the customer, you know, depending on what they required. And this was a, um, this was to commemorate 50 years collaboration between Caffins and Rolls um, for, for the various vehicles and coach bodies that they, that they converted. And this was in Marine Parade, that was the one that was built um, in 1910 and that was it in 1924, the body building. You can begin to see the frame o o on that one. And then there was a panel beating shop for the metal parts and a paint shop and the trimmer's shop. These were all at Marine Parade. And then these are some of the vehicles which they, they made. Well then, we come to the expansion. This, just as a matter of interest, they, were, they branched out into um, radios and they had a radio room in the Terminus Road premises. And then the next generation joined the company. On the left was Sidney Caffin, that's my father, and on the right, Edward Caffin. And Sidney joined in 1922 and Edward in 1925. And Sidney was the sales manager and Edward the service manager in charge of all the service. And then I expect a lot of you knew 507 Seaside, the big workshops there. They were opened in 1930 by Sir William Morris, who later became Lord Nuffield. And then further expansion um, at Haywards Heath, I expect many of you, when you go on the train to London, if you look out on the left, a bit down below the platform is um, our station garage. That was opened in 1935. And then in East did another branch. And this was on Kingsway Hove on the seafront. You can see the, the s sort of the style of three or four of those garages with these curves rather than rectangular corners. So this was the expansion between the wars, really. And um, Bexhill and going down, there was a branch at Guildford at one stage, Western Road, Brighton, Queen's Garage in Eastbourne, Haywards Heath, Lewis, Worthing, and um, Hastings, Chaley, Burgess Hill, Uckfield, Tunbridge, Horsham, East Grinstead. Goring and Crowborough. Well, then we come to the Second World War. And at the outbreak of war in 1939, we were employing 450 men and women. And as I mentioned, the staff um, jo many of the staff joined the Territorial Army and in the first week in September 39, 123 were called up and so the company lost a Joint Managing Director, that's Edward Caffin, six branch managers and a quarter of the entire staff. Well. Some of you will remember 
what happened in the war. There was petrol rationing and um, the turnover halved and 14 premises were requisitioned. But in May 1940, the Brighton premises were appointed a civilian training school for army mechanics and we trained about 8,000 troops during the next five years. And Marine Parade produced tools for the ordnance factories and Brighton produced aircraft parts. And in September 1940, this is Meads Road, you can see it was bombed. Now that's the back, the part of the head office, it, um, but it's the frontage in Saffron's Road. I don't know whether you can picture it. Um, if you go into Saffron's Road, that would be on the left-hand side. The, um, at 507 Seaside, on the roof, there was a Canadian army unit and it had a gun post and they were delighted to shoot down a Fokker Wolf 190 from the roof of Seaside. So Hove was appointed as an army auxiliary workshop and this is a Morris commercial field artillery tractor. And then on the 6th of June 43, Marine Parade, which was our big coach shop, and as you can see, um, three stories, was um, destroyed. That's a painting by Frank Wooten, who's um, a war artist. I expect a lot of you have heard of him. So, um, fortunately, I think it happened um, on a Sunday and um, there weren't any staff in it. Well, after the war, the expansion continued. This is Seaford. I expect many of you have driven past that. Um, on the 259. Um, now it's a bit sad that um, this garage served the people of Seaford naturally and um, they were able to t have their cars serviced in Seaford but and we felt that that sort of size garage was suitable for a place the size of Seaford but the manufacturers have gradually wanted bigger uh, and bigger showrooms and of course on that site you couldn't have a bigger showroom. Um, and we, it, it had functioned extremely well as a dealer under the main showroom in Eastbourne and you know customers in Seaford could go in and inspect cars and purchase cars there and have their cars serviced without having to travel into Eastbourne but unfortunately the manufacturers wanted bigger and sort of ritzier um, premises and so there's you've probably noticed that gradually um, there are fewer small garages and the, the larger garages have, have been um, smartened up to um, we, we rather feel that most customers don't want the showrooms to be too smart because they think they're um, having to pay for it, you see. <laughs> there you are. This is on the, the main road north. It's Willingdon and um, now you've got a Marks and Spencer on the right and a BP site. 
that's Maidstone. And that was Britain's in Brighton. Now, in 1955, the turnover had reached 4.5 million up here. You can see how it's um, increased. Way back in um, 1904, it was 5,000. But um, that is the growth of the turnover. But the turnover, of course, included about 3 million gallons of petrol per annum. And in those days, petrol was served by forecourt staff. And um, the cars used to be serviced every month. We had a what they called Scheme C, whereby you could pay at the beginning of the year and have your car serviced every month. Nowadays, most people only have them serviced every year, unless they do a big mileage. Well, in 1955, we were carrying out about 140,000 repair and service jobs each year. The Parts department had two five-ton bulk vans to collect spare parts from the factory and about six 20 to 30 hundredweight vans distributing parts to branches in the trade. And so sort of every day about 6,000 entries were made on the parts stock cards. And we were selling uh, about 4,500 new cars a year and 2,500 second-hand cars. You can see where the branches were from Margate in the east to Goring in the west at that time. And it it was mainly Sussex and um, also Kent. Later, uh, it expanded as far west as Dorchester. Well, in 1961, I joined the company together with my brother Alan and cousin Anthony, and the company became quoted on the stock exchange and before that we were appointed directors. In 1963, my uncle was, the one on the left, was knighted for public services. He was deputy chairman of the Territorial Army under the Duke of Norfolk, and he'd also been chairman of the Sussex Police Authority. In 1965, we had our centenary. It was a hundred years since William Morris Caffin had opened his first shop. And then, in 1965, our turnover by now had gone up to 10 million, and the staff had reached about 1,500, some of whom had been with the company over 50 years, and many over 25 years. Obviously, a, a firm like ours, it's very important, the staff training and the staff relations and um, the um, company had formed a pension scheme for, for staff and um, obviously 
the, the business of, of running a business like this is you've got three responsibilities, really. One is to the shareholders who supplied the capital. One is it to, for the customers. You've got to supply a good service. And the other is to the staff, because you've got to keep um, a well-trained and um, enthusiastic staff as well. And it's a matter of um, keeping those three things in balance. Well, since 1965, staff numbers have actually reduced. The reason for this is that, for example, Forecourt staff used to serve petrol. Um, and this has gradually been phased out. And motorists, as you will probably notice, get out of their cars to, to serve themselves. Well, we thought that wouldn't happen in Eastbourne, um, but um, we were wrong. And in fact, most Eastbournians do just that. So no longer is it, do, do you have forecourt staff. And similarly with the accounts, um, they've been computerized. First, we used to have handwritten sales ledgers, which had to be balanced every month. I mean, it's one of my jobs was to go around the branches to those branches we, who'd failed to balance their sales ledger and sort it out. But of course, now the accounts are computerized, first with um, punch cards and punch card operators, but now we just have desktop computers. And similarly, um, shorthand typists, we, we have far fewer of those now. And then the parts records, we um, used to have parts stock clerks who, who wrote up each sale and, and each um, supply of parts coming in. And um, now all that is computerized. And now, in fact, the staff are down to about 400, but the turnover has risen to 224 million. So in my day, the annual report had been, for many years, about 20 pages long. Now, with all the increased legislation, it's 86 pages. I don't think anybody reads it, but um, <laughs> that's different. Well, my father was knighted in 1972, and he had received a CBE in 59 for services to industrial relations. He was on an industrial relations court. Then he was senior pro-chancellor and chairman of the council at the University of Sussex. And he was on the County Borough of Eastbourne's council from 1937 to 1974. And during that time, he was mayor three times. He was also session clerk at St Andrew's Presbyterian Church for many years. And although he was session clerk, it was my mother who wrote up the minutes. But he, he was a committed Christian and founded the meeting house or chapel at the University of Sussex. And he was also on the committee that planned the uniting of the Presbyterian and Congregational Churches to form the United Reformed Church. So he'd have welcomed what's happening in Eastbourne at the moment, where four congregations, two URC and two Methodists, have come together to form Emmanuel Church. And I expect some of you have seen the new building being built in Upperton Road, 
at the corner with Watts Lane, which we hope will be open this summer. Well, I thought I'd finish with showing you some of the um, classic cars or, or veteran cars which are seen from time to time in the showrooms at uh, Meads Road. So this is um, the, a Benz and then a Woolsey Sidley and another Woolsey. Of course, we were Woolsey agents when... And then a Morris Oxford. Well, I expect some of you may have seen some of the veteran cars on the seafront this last weekend. And a Delage. This is, once more, Caffin's bodywork. And this is a Rolls with, with, with the bodywork, which was made at Marine Parade. So, I don't know whether you've got any questions you'd like to... Um, uh, that I've or, or would like to comment on. Uh, oh, sorry, yes? Uh, you've mentioned the architecture of the various houses yes. with their curved form. Yeah. Was that a family thing or a company policy or a particular firm you employed? A bit of each, I think, really, right. yes, yes. I mean, they, the, the, the firm we employed obviously designed them, but, um, you know, it was a deliberate policy, right. yes. Thank you. That, that train you saw shown is for the Jane Wick Miniature Railway, which is a very unsalubrious suburb of Clacton. I don't think it's there anymore. Oh, it's gone. Well, it, it was near Sidmouth um, at one time. Um, that, 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 that Joe Wick is a rather unsalubrious suburb of Clacton on Sea. Oh, that's right. Oh dear, because w I, I was down there about 20 years ago and saw it then. then. But, oh dear. I don't know if it's still there. No, that's, no. That's where that was. It's nothing to do with the trams that are now in sea. Ah. Yes? Um, you mentioned the uh, turnover in 200 million uh, as well as now. Yes. Well, I mean, in Eastbourne, in Lockbridge Drove, you've got um, you've got the uh, Volvo on one side of the road and the Volkswagen on the other side, and then round the corner you've got the Audi. Right. So th those are the three garages in Eastbourne. Um, there's um, well, they the total. You have to have separate premises for each franchise now. At one time, you could only have one franchise in any town, but the Monopolies Commission stopped that. And so long as you've got separate premises, you can have more than one franchise. Um, but, um, yes, I, I'm too honest, I don't know. We used to have about 50 branches, but as I mentioned, a lot of those were quite small. And, and some of them were really just uh, large filling stations. Well, the oil companies came along and um, um, grabbed the... Um, they liked to, to, to have their own filling stations and own them. And um, so we, we, we don't have many f filling stations at all now. But um, it's buying and, and, and selling cars and repairs and coach and body works and um, part sales are, are, are very large as well. Thank you. Yes? Just as an aside, really, you showed the slide of a, a, a Fokker Wolf plane that came down. Yes. I've been interviewing an old boy who used to live just over the road, and he's now in his 90s, living at Hurston Zoo, and he's actually got some amazing stories we hope to publish for uh, Society Book. When that plane came over, shooting its guns, 
Yes. No. Oh. Got, got it done. Oh, how interesting. Oh. Oh, dear. Well, I expect a lot of you have got war stories. I mean, I can remember as a child when the, the doodle bugs were going, and we used to go out and watch them. And it's not until the engines stopped that you had to dash for the shelter. Yes? There's, um, well, my nephew is the um, chief executive, and my daughter is the company secretary. But the other directors are not family members. Sorry? Um, the, uh, well, um, it, 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 the, the shares are quoted on the stock exchange, but the family is still, um, it's got a share structure such that some preference shares own 40% of the votes. It's, it's rather complicated, but the, the long and the short is that the family can stop a takeover if they want to. Yes, Tom? Can you tell us a little more about the um, showroom in Leeds Road? The, the vehicles in it now, the old vehicles, presumably they're owned by the company. Yes. Uh, I mean, do they go outside? The they, uh, the occasional wedding, um, what one will go out, and I think the, the Benz goes in the London to Brighton rally, and then it may well be, I don't know whether they went out, you know, on, um, was it last weekend when on, on the seafront? So, so that, you know, you know they, they do go out, um, but it's a convenient place to, to store them, really, and, you know, people like looking at them. But, of course, it used to be a Jaguar showroom. Before that, it was a Rolls show, showroom. But... In the old days, Jaguar had well, at least four distributors in Sussex. Well, then it went down to two, and then I think it's gone down to one now. You know, they, they expect a, a huge, um, and and then they they do expect the garage to go and deliver cars all over the town, all over the county, but. Um, it, it meant that Eastbourne lost its Jaguar franchise. So, sorry? Yes. But the Marine, behind the Queen's Hotel, basically, um, there's a funny, the roads are a bit peculiar there now, so, and they've been, they go over where Marine Parade was. Well, thank you very much.